Hello friends, welcome to the second lecture on consumer psychology course. Uh, this course is floated by NPTEL MOOCs and this is the second lecture in the series of introducing consumer behavior. <coughs> now in this lecture of, uh, of course of consumer psychology, uh, the first two uh, sections were dedicated to introducing what is consumer behavior, what it consists of, what are the uh, main um, ingredients of consumer behavior and these sort of things. As I introduced in the first lecture, this is what we will be looking into the first two lectures and this is the second lecture uh, in a series of the two lectures. In the last lecture, we looked at what is consumer behavior, like what is consumer and why do consumers go into the market for buying anything and the basic thing that we saw there or the basic principle that we saw there, the underlying uh, reason why consumers go into the market that we saw there was to get benefits and the line that I quoted there was that consumer going to the market not to buy products, but to buy benefits out of products and so we saw uh, <coughs> that there are three types of consumers. So, when, when consumers go into the market, they act or fall into three categories. We have something called the shoppers, we have something called the buyers and we have something called the actual consumers. And so, shopper, buyer and uh, the differentiation between the shopper, buyer and consumers I uh, explained in the last lecture, how do they differentiate. Now, we also looked at uh, uh, how uh, these shoppers, buyers and consumers actually go ahead and make a purchase and uh, what are the uh, various factors involved in making those purchases. From there on, we moved into the idea of something called market segmentation. I explained to you why market segmentation is to be included in this first section of consumer behavior. The reason is that if we have uh, a universal market, if we have a market which is uh, uh, universal which manufactures goods for everyone, then it is something which consumers are not attracted to. And so, we need to have a market which is diverse, which is which is um, uh, which has products uh, of many nature, because individuals are different, consumers are different. Now, the basic of psychology is that something called individual differences, which means that each individual is different. Now, the thing is, if marketers go by this principle, then they have to make a product for everyone, which is entirely not possible. So, what they tend to do is that they tend to find uh, people which are alike or people which are seeking benefits which are alike and that is the reason why we included the idea of market segmentation, which is the second thing. Now, what does market segmentation actually do is market segmentation basically segments a market, segments consumers into groups. Uh, which are like minded and which are looking for similar kind of benefits and this eases the marketers in terms of making products which is will appeal to these people or which will sat satisfy the needs of these people and that is the reason why we looked at what is market segmentation. In there we also looked at um, how market segmentation is done, something called segment viability and um, many other things and we further looked into something called segmentation strategy. For example, we looked at two or three segmentation strategy that I remember on now. What is the segmentation strategy being mass marketing? So, when a product is made for everyone in similar ways, for example, a low environment product like salt which is made for everyone in a similar way. And then we also looked at other marketing strategies which is called uh, differentiated marketing where a marketer or targets only one group of consumers. For example, Audi a high end car a manufacturer just targets one group or uh, a phenyl company which targets uh, um, or uh, the, the lower income group or, or the low involvement, the, the, the lower group of consumers, uh, not the high end uh, consumers. So, basically this segmentation strategy is dependent on uh, what the marketer actually wants from the market. So, these are the two sections that we roughly covered in the first lecture. In the second lecture, what I am going to do is I am going to start with telling you when a, uh, how a consumer makes a decision. Now, when a consumer goes into the market and uh, assuming that uh, he is the shopper, buyer or, or the consumer or, or th all three of them and uh, he goes into the market into a, into a segmented market or he goes into a market which is like him uh, in the marketplace. When he goes there to buy something, he is interested in buying product benefits out of it. Now, when he goes into the market, there will be several products which would appeal to him, which will offer to him the same benefits, right. So, number of products are there, uh, the number of uh, benefits are there and these benefits are more or less the similar. 
So, why is it that the consumer buys one type of product and doesn't buy another kind, kind of product? And what we call it in consumer psychology, this kind of uh, problem in consumer psychology is something called consumer decision making process or consumer decision process. And so, that is what we are going to look at in, in brief uh, in, uh, in this particular lecture of how does the consumer actually make uh, the decision of buying a particular product and not buying a particular uh, product from a particular market segment or a particular segmented market. So, we will look at very briefly to the steps which is involved and we will discuss a common uh, theory which is called the uh, an, uh, Engel uh, Kallath theory of the E K B theory of uh, uh, consumer decision making. Towards the end of this lecture, we will look at something called the methods of doing research in consumer uh, uh, behavior or consumer psychology. And uh, in, in, in the further classes which, which will come, we will look into all the psychological variables which are involved in making consumer decision process. So, in this particular lecture, I will just introduce uh, you to the idea of consumer decision making or the process of consumer decision making. So, basically what is consumer decision making? As I said, when a consumer goes into the market, he is looking at benefits, he is looking at benefits to buy from particular products and so there are several products which are available to him which gives him the lot of benefits. So, how does he choose between one product and not the other product? The process which involves here, the process which is involved here is something called consumer decision making process. So, consumer, so th uh, there are a number of models in, the, in, in consumer psychology which goes ahead and explains how does the consumer decide which product to buy and which product not to buy. And so, consumer decision models, they describe the process consumers actually go through before, during and after making a purchase. Because this decision making process of, of using a, a particular product or preferring a particular product over the another is a long one. It starts with identifying which products to buy, then actually consuming the product or basically getting involved with the product and once you are done with it, you either are satisfied or unsatisfied and based on that, whether you want to get involved with the product again or make a switch or make a uh, uh, choice between different products. And so, this is how the consumer decision models uh, actually act. Now, what is a model? A consumer, we have been discussing about something called consumer decision model. So, what actually a model is? Now, a model actually is a process which maps antecedents which are causes of a particular behavior and the behavior in question here is something called the buying behavior. So, what a consumer decision model will try to do is we look at those antecedents or those causes which make a particular consumer go into the market and purchase a particular product and then it will map this to the consequences or the reason of this particular behavior. So, the behavior of buying something, the reason why you buy and once you buy it and use it, the, what are the results out of it? The mapping between these is done by any consumer decision model. Also, consumer decision model, uh, they establish cause and effect and help marketers anticipate and possibly influence consumer action. So, these consumer decision model, they kind of try to make the relation between the cause and effect uh, of how a consumer behavior is or a how a consumer is actually behaving into the market and then this helps the marketer into anticipating uh, uh, and, and finding out new ways of influencing consumer action. How should he make more consumers? So, for example, those actions where uh, it could be decided of how to influence consumer in a particular way so that he buys a particular product. He does not buy a particular product, he uh, gets satisfied with a particular product or increase the satisfaction level after usage, before usage and so on and so forth. So, all those procedures, all those methods that the marketers can use to influence the consumer to buying his particular product and getting satisfied with it is what the consumer decision model is going to do. So, right now I have for here uh, in front of you a very popular model which is called the E K B model, the angle Collat and Blackwell model of consumer decision making. And so, it is a very, very popular model and it is believed that when people, when consumers actually are buying something called a high involvement product. Now, let me first specify what is high involvement product and what is low involvement product. Now, in generally there are four type of products, but I will just discuss two of it. The first is called the high involvement product. These are those products for, uh, for which the consumer is very excited. It requires investment of money, time and other psychological factors of the consumer and it is a high end purchase. For example, if the consumer is going to buy a car, it is a high end product or it is a high involvement product. 
On the other hand, we have something called the low involvement product, which does not require too much on the side of the consumer. So, the consumer does not really ne uh, need to think about it, need to do any kind of action into it, invest money into it or psychology, invest himself psychology in, into it, gather information about the product and so on and so forth. So, for example, buying a salt or phenyl is a low involvement product. And so, basically this model the five steps that is given in this model, this uh, most consumers who go through these five steps are the one which are actually doing something called high involvement product buying. For low involvement product buying, it may be possible that the consumer may not go through all these five uh, stages one by one. So, let me briefly uh, make you understand what these five processes are and what are the various psychological variables that we will be dealing in this uh, whole course of consumer psychology. So, starting with uh, the first step for that any consumer has to understand is the arousal of a need. The consumer needs something, right. So, there is a discrepancy between uh, uh, his satisfaction level and uh, or there is there is some kind of uh, uh, lowering of, of his satisfaction and so he needs to buy something. And so, the first step in any consumer buying or any consumer purchase is the arousal of a need. For example, I do not have something and I so want that. So, I do not have a laptop and I need that and the, uh, this gives me the arousal of the need because there is some kind of a school work that I have to do. And so, this is where the need arousal is. And so, uh, once that need arousal is the whole process of consumer decision making starts place. So, this consumer decision making model of the EKB or the Engel, Collatin, Blackwell basically has five steps into it. It starts with the input step. The first step when a consumer actually goes in the market, the first step of how he decides to buy a particular product. Uh, and not the other product which where both of them are offering you the same kind of benefit starts with the input phase. Now, in the input phase the consumer looks at these kind of adverts from uh, the marketers. So, different kind of advertisement, different kind of informations which uh, are provided to him and he captures this information into his uh, memory or he stores these information into this memory. So, a number of uh, in the input phase a number of um, in information is provided by the marketers to the consumer. In the information processing stage, which is the second stage in consumer decision process, there are four steps that are basically involved. Now, here once these information that the marketers have, the marketing advertisements the marketer has about his uh, product, when this is passed on to the consumer, what the consumer actually does is he looks at this information and processes this information. And how does he do, do that? By the first step is the exposure, how the particular uh, advertisement of how the product information is passed on to the consumer. So, what is the exposure type? The exposure type could be through a television, could be newspaper, so any, any method of exposures. The second step is paying attention. The marketers have to be sure that the consumer is paying attention to the particular product. At times what happens is the product is uh, advertisement is made in such a way that the actual product disappears out of it. And so, consumers cannot or are not able to pay attention. So, the next step the marketer has to do or the next step in consumer decision process is paying attention. So, now the consumer has a lot of information available to him and what now he has to do is taking this expo uh, information and pay attention to it. The third stage in this is comprehension. Does he understand? So, an advertisement or information about a particular product is given to the consumer, does he understand that information? If he does not understand, then uh, what would happen is they will not be able to distinguish product A from B. So, whatever information, extra information a particular product is giving or whatever uh, information a particular product is giving, does the consumer understand it? And a good example is those ads from uh, the late 90s and the first part of 20th century, which were uh, those life uh, saving ads, right. And so, those would uh, read the terms and conditions in such a fast pace that consumers would not understand it. And so, that was a demerit of the ad. And so, consumers would not invest because they did not understand what is happening, right. And sometimes ads are made in such a way where uh, the consumer does not even understand what the ad is actually talking about. So, it is made in such a fancy way. Right? So, the next step is comprehension and once the comprehension is done, once the, com uh, the consumer understands the ad, he has to go through the stage of acceptance. He has to accept whatever the consumer is saying. So, in here comes the value of truth, comes the value of trust and so on and so forth. So, he has to accept whatever the consumer is saying, whatever the marketer is saying. So, the consumer has to accept that. For example, the market, uh, marketer comes in with the idea 
idea that I have, uh, um, I am selling uh, washing powder which has blue, green and uh, yellow crystals and these cr crystals are uh, oxycarbon or whatever, whatever. So, the idea is that the consumer has to accept this, you have to make it in such a way that the consumer actually accepts these ideas and once he accepts these ideas, then he will retain this information in his memory and so that is why I have retention and memory and so once this comes in this retention consumer understands that this is what the product is available and these are the what the features is and then the third step is the decision process where he does the actual comparison in this there is the process so initially the uh, marketers puts up an ad and the consumer looks at this ads understands it uh, accepts it and retains it in memory now the actual problem recognition happens. Here the consumer understands that he needs to buy that particular product which he has seen about. From there he will look into uh, the search variable. So, he will start searching about that particular product, where it is available, how it is available and so on and so forth. So, do not worry we will be looking at all these processes one by one in the upcoming chapters and then once uh, he does a search, he will come to know that whatever need he has, for example, if he is hungry, he wants to buy food. So, he will look at all the, he will search for all the places where he can get food and from there he has to do an alternate evaluation. Alternate evaluation is basically evaluating between all the alternatives which are there, which can satisfy his need. So, in our case, if the need is hunger, he will have so many food items to be looked at and to be eaten and so he has to decide which food item to eat and that depends upon a number of variables, for example, uh, how much hungry do you feel, how much money do you have, how much healthy a particular product is and so many variables, psychological variables which might be there. We will look into those variables because those are the ones which make you help uh, making a decision and so we will look into those variables one by one. Once an alternate evaluation is done, a final choice is accepted and this is the uh, fourth part of the decision process and once the final choice has been done, a purchase is converted. So, at times what happens is a uh, consumer uh, might go through all the four process, choose and then may not make the purchase and so that is not a successful decision making and that is not very good for marketers. And so, the fifth step is that the consumer, that the marketer has to force or have to be take uh, taken care of is that the choice turns into some kind of a purchase and once the consumer purchases a particular product, there are only two outcomes that is possible, a satisfaction or a dissatisfaction. If the consumer purchases a product by doing alternate evaluation and making a choice and then he uses it, if he is satisfied, he will again buy that product and this loop of brand loyalty will come in. If he suffers a dissatisfaction, he will start the whole process again. As you can see this line, he will start the whole process again by doing an alternative search and then doing alternative evaluation, trying a second product, third product, fourth product, fifth product, so on and so forth and that is how the thing is. Of course, in between there can also be something called cognitive dissonance, a state where he feels something and he acts in some way and in those cases again if the consumer buys something, but he was liking something else and so there, there is where a dis dissonance is created and in those cases also what he has to do is again go back to the search process and then the, do the alternate evaluation of all the products which are available in front of him, then make a choice, make a purchase and the outcome whether satisfaction or dissatisfaction. Now, the fourth step in this model is something called the decision variables. Now, these are those psychological variables which actually make a consumer make or go through all these decision processes of problem recognition, search, alternate evaluation, choice, purchase and outcomes and these are consumers belief. So, what he believes into, what his belief system says to, consumers motive, how much motivated he is to buy that particular product, how much uh, energized he feels towards buying that particular product, consumer attitude, the likingness or unlikingness of to a particular product, the feeling towards a particular product which is there, the lifestyle that he has uh, kind of, so different lifestyle people will have different kind of choices and so uh, the other factors being intentions, number of evaluative criteria and normative compliances. Normative compliances is basically uh, complying to the norm. So, basically uh, the idea that we should not buy a pink color car because the norm is that a, a dark color car is much better than a uh, lighter color car or nobody buys a pink color car or orange color car. So, that is normative compliance. Uh, uh, basically sticking to the norms of what the society is. And evaluative criteria is how much criteria or how much um, characteristics or how much benefit bundles are we actually looking at and on what basis are we comparing two products. So, let us say we have two products A and B and they match on 
six criterias, but the product A has eight different criterias and the product B has six only. So, then deciding between A and B product will be dependent on how many characteristics or how many criterias that are we going to take for the evaluation. And these criterias could be very easily be price, the availability, the aftermarket services and these can be the characteristics of why you should buying a product. And so, n number of criterias can be taken in and actually uh, a final outcome or a final choice can be made between products. Now, the fifth factor that is there in, in our uh, in uh, the EKB model is called the external factors. So, not only these psychological factors or this decision processes of importance for us in the EKB model, uh, some other external factors from the society may also or does also affect our buying decisions or decision making of particular product. And these can be cultural norms, so what cultural norms actually there, the social class where you are in the society, which class, the upper class, the lower class, the middle class and so on and so forth, reference group, whom are you talking to, what is your reference group, whom when you buy a product, whom are you competing with, so that is kind of a reference group, family influences, what does your family say before buying a product or how, how you buying a product and so on and so forth and unexpected circumstances, I explain things like unavailability of the product or you are, uh, you are not left with any money. And so, that was those factors may also affect this consumer decision process of how you buy a particular product. So, this is how the EKB model really works and, and so, we will uh, go into one of all these uh, processes of information processing decision and decision variables one by one, because these are the psychological variables which are of interest to us. And so, in this particular course of consumer psychology, we will be only looking at those psychological factors which actually help the consumer in buying a particular product or buy the underlying uh, uh, line that I said at the very beginning of this course, buying the benefits out of the product. And so, that is what is of importance to us. So, the EKB model uh, as we saw, it is a multi dimensional model as I said there are 4 or 5 dimensions to it. And so, uh, the components of the decision making in this model is we have discussed before as we discussed before is the input where the advertisement is or the in product information is passed on by the marketer. The information processing, this is the phase in which the consumer actually sees the ad, understands the ad, comprehends it, retains it keeps it to memory, uh, plays with it and so on and so forth. The decision process, this is that step where the consumer understands that he has a need, that he wants something, then he does something called searching for all the products which are available. So, need arousal, product search and then looking at the alternatives which are available in the market. So, how many kind of products are available, what benefit they are offering, making a choice between them and finally, buying the product. And once you buy that particular product, buy that, buy any kind of product which is there, what is the final outcome out of it. So, what is the final whether you are satisfied, unsatisfied or feeling cognitive dissonance out of it. And so, this these are the decision process. Now, a number of variables actually help you in making decisions. As I said, these variables could be anything uh, starting from motivation, from the belief system, for the number of ability criteria that you use, from complying to uh, the uh, normative influences and so on and so forth. So, a number of psychological factors, your motivation level, uh, your attitude towards a particular product and these psychological variables actually help you make decisions and these variables help the decision process at several steps. So, we have 5 or 6 steps in making a decision of buying a particular product and get and, and feeling good or bad about it and so these variables will actually affect. And then at the end of it, we have something called the external influences which are uh, things which comes from the society. So, cultural influences, influences uh, which are uh, what social group do you belong to, what kind of family do you have, what kind of family input are there and so these are external factors which are outside the consumer which actually makes you make a decision. So, the EKB demonstrates the multiple relationships and interactions among con components. So, what the EKB does is, it is a it is a very widely used model and so, what this model does is, it makes you understand between uh, the how one factor is related to the other factor and across groups, across steps and across variables. So, it, it does that, it does kind of a multi dimensional component analysis of how a consumer actually buys a particular product. So, potential consumers are continually subjected to input from all kinds that is what we see. So, some inputs are market control such as advertising and so this input phase where the consumer sees information the, the start of the model here what happens is the inputs are 
either controlled by the market or it is uh, advertising or it is not controlled by the market. Sometimes you run across uh, people from word of mouth, you hear about products and so on and so forth. And some of these come, uh, come from friends and personal collections. As I said, so some of these are market control and some of these are personal recollections from your friends word of mouth, friends believe and so on and so forth. The EKV model identifies uh, five information processing systems uh, which are there. One is the exposure, the retention, the attention, yielding and comprehension. As we saw the five steps which are there. The first step you are exposed to the information. So, you actually see the information for the first time. The second uh, step has to be attention where you pay attention to the particular information which is out there. Then you have something called comprehension where you comprehend, you understand what is, is being said, you retain it to memory and then finally at the time of the need when you actually go ahead to buy a particular product, when the needs arouses for buying a particular product, you actually go ahead and remember that this product is out there and then go ahead and buy it. Again, consumer decision process, five step process starts with need recognition. So, any decision that you want to make in the market, anything that you want to buy in the market starts with first understanding that there is a need that you want to buy something and it is available or not. Then information search, you find all the information about the products which are available to you. So, if, if I have a, so let us say tomorrow I want to buy a camera, I need a very good camera and so the need has arose because I am traveling abroad and I want to capture everything abroad, I want to show my friends what I have been there, uh, how I have spent my life there and so on and so forth. And so, a need of a camera arises. Now, once the need of this camera arises, I induce something called information search. Now, I, I have in my mind what kind of camera I am looking for. So, I do a long search of what kind of uh, cameras are available, what kind of lens are available, what kind of memory is there, the pixel rate and all those kinds of information search I do. And then once I have all those informations available, I will come to know that okay, there are 4 or 5 brands which are in the market and uh, do an alternate evaluation, which basically means that I keep all the 4 or 5 com camera brands. So, Nikon, Canon, um, uh, Mitsubishi, whatever, whatever, four or five brands which are there, all of them are more or less offering the same things to me. Now, I need to do an alternate evaluation, select one of those brands which are there. And then a final choice where I, when I do the comparison, I will give some weights to it, I will uh, assign some merits and demerits to all these choices and from there, I will come to a final choice of which camera to buy and which camera to not buy. And the final thing is the outcome. Once I buy this camera, I take it abroad with me, I click photographs and when the photographs come turn to life, when I want to share this, there will be an outcome. So, whether the, if the photographs are what I wanted, really wanted, if, if it is satisfactory to me, I are in a satisfactory or at times it would happen that uh, if I am looking at a camera, I do not know how to operate it, maybe several, several other things happen and the camera does not give that good result that I am looking at and so it is dissatisfaction. And so, this satisfaction, dissatisfaction is very important because that decides whether I will further on go ahead and involve with that product, which basically means that I will buy that product or I would not buy that particular product. As I said, the outcomes from any kind of uh, this model is two things, a positive evaluation leads to satisfaction, a negative evaluation leads to dissatisfaction. So, if I buy the product and I am satisfied with it, it gives me the benefit that I am looking for, or for, I will be highly satisfied and I promise to be with the company, I become something called loyal. And if I am negative evaluation, if I buy a product, it is not helping me in any way or it, it, it causes me some kind of a pain, whether it is psychological pain, a mental pain, any kind of pain which is out there, a physical pain, then it will lead to dissatisfaction satisfaction and so, I will not buy that product and also not promote that product. So, um, understand that word of mouth is another very important factor. So, you do trust your friends and all and so, one way of gaining trust is uh, from friends and relatives. And so, one of the things with this with product dissatisfaction is that people try to blame products to, to start negative rumors with it and so on and so forth. So, that kind of thing could happen. Now, I, it could be either a positive or negative satisfaction or it could be a dissonance as I said, it could happen that dissonance is the feeling of uncertainty that you have made the right choice. It may happen that when you buy a product, immediately you find or you start believing that you might not have got the right product because of several reasons. And in those cases also, what happens is after buying a product, the next time I will try some other product. So, if a cognitive dissonance happens, the dissonance happens because you feel something, you believe in something and you do something. And when you do something else and you believe something else, when there is no match between the, these two things, 
things, then a phenomena in psychology happens which is called cognitive dissonance. You are not satisfied or you are not uh, completely in line with what you do and what you say. And so, this when this happens, in those cases what happens is you again go back to the table, you again go back to the search process, information search process and then search for the right thing. So, if, uh, if neither satisfaction or dissatisfaction happens, uh, cognitive dissonance happens, most consumers again go back to searching, making alternative evaluations and then follow that loop again and again. And so, that kind of a thing is what is uh, another output of um, the consumer decision process. Now, if consumers are satisfied with the purchase, they become loyal, if they are not, they become disloyal, they leave the product and that, that kind of thing happens. So, basically this is how the consumer decision model or consumer decision process actually works or are, is actually uh, modeled on to by using the EKB model. <coughs> now, next on we will look into something which is called consumer uh, studying consumer behavior. So, how does a scientific study of consumer behavior actually takes place? What is the process or how does uh, someone do consumer behavior study? <coughs> so, the study of consumer behavior is basically an applied science, it is applied science because it takes in methodologies from several branches of social sciences and natural sciences which is available and which draws on to knowledge from disciplines such as economics, psychology, sociology and statistics. So, a number of disciplines are there and we borrow in information methodologies. Uh, tactics, statistics and, and uh, several other uh, data collection methods, data mining methods from so many different branches of, of sciences out there and use them combined together and these methods when combined together is actually called the methodology for doing research in consumer behavior. Now, methods employed to study consumer behaviors are, there are several methods which are there which I will outline. The first is called the observation method. Now, generally speaking what happens in observation method in is that the person who is doing the observation, he reports or he observes um, whatever is happening in front of him and so that is what observation is all about. What he does is he can and there are two kinds of observation, one is called the participatory observation, the other is called the non-participatory observation. So, the person who is seeing a phenomena unfold in front of him, he can either participate into it or may not participate in it. Let us take the example of how consumers actually uh, deal with uh, wrappers of ice creams. Let us see if that is what my observation is. So, what the, the, the scientist who is involved or the research uh, fellow who is involved in doing conducting this research, or if he is using an observation method, what he is going to do is sit outside those uh, ice cream parlors and either passively observe what consumers do after buying an ice cream or eating an ice cream, where do they throw, where they do not throw and if that is what my interest is. So, what does he do with the wrapper of an ice cream and in the participatory phase what he could do is he could actually buy an ice cream and participate with this whole process of using or throwing away the wrapper. So, basically there are two types of observation. So, basically in observation what he does is he just observes, he does not do any change, he does not manipulate anything in, uh, in, in the field or in the question. So, observation, this approach to study consumer behavior consists primarily of observing consumers behavior in different situations. So, what happens is here person, the researcher who's in, who is interested in studying consumer behavior through, uh, through observation, what he does is he just observes the consumer uh, when he is doing something and some observational techniques the particular observation techniques which are out there is something called in-home observation. So, there are two observation techniques that we will be discussing here, one is called the in-home observation and the other is called the shadowing observation. Now, in-home observation is a kind of observation technique which is generally widely used in consumer behavior research. What happens here is which places marketers inside people's home to examine exactly how products are consumed. So, what happens here is when we buy a particular product a marketer, a researcher who is interested in finding out how people interact with the product, how people go through the consumption process right from buying it to using it to throwing it outside. How does this work? What uh, the researcher will do is that he would actually go into the house of the person who is bought that product and map him or see him using the product from stage to stage. So, the marketer goes inside people's home and examining how exactly products are consumed. For example, let us say if I am a uh, consumer, uh, if I am a marketer who wants to understand how people uses packaged juices. So, what I will do is I will uh, utilize some people 
who are paid interns and so these people what they will do is they will uh, buy the juice with people and then go into the houses and see how people uh, interact with juices. So, how do they drink it, how many times they drink it, do they drink it in one go, do they drink it in uh, men multiple uh, sessions, uh, do they uh, cool it, do they not cool it, do they transfer the contents of the cartoon into something else, do they do not, all those kinds of acts I can actually observe when I am inside somebody's home who is consuming uh, these um, products or this fruit juices. Now, the observation may be done with personal interview and surveys, video cameras and other technologies that measure actual experiences with the product. So, what I can do is the intern who is interested in finding out how consumers interact with natural juices is he can start asking interview questions. He can ask questions like what do you do with it, how do you do with it and so on and so forth. He could do surveys, uh, ask people in the family, several people in the family several questions uh, and do other kind of surveys which are there or use video cameras for actually monitoring what happens with the product. So, he can put in a camera when he can monitor how many times you drink juice, what is the way in which you drink juice, do you drink, do you drink juice pure, unpure and so many other things which are there and he can use other technologies. Uh, which which are uh, in available in the field and do these observations uh, in inside the house of the consumer. The second one is something called shadowing. So, here the in the first case this is called participatory observation in this, this is called non participatory observation. And so, what happens here is that uh, in which a researcher accompanies or shadows consumers through the shopping and consumption process asking questions about each step of the process. And so, what happens here is that uh, in the first case, the, the intern will go into the house and ask questions, do interviews, do surveys uh, from video cameras, capture things and all. In the shadowing, what happens is uh, intern shadows the person, it follows along the person right from the time that he is making the choice to buying it, to going into his house, house and actually seeing how the consumption process happens and how the discard of the product is done. So, all these processes are shadowed, he be, he, he is there he, uh, with the consumer at each step asking questions about why he is doing something and why he is not doing something and so acts like a shadow to the actual consumer. The third observation technique that uh, we use in consumer research is something called the physiological observation method. Now, in the first two methods what happens is that an actual intern goes into the house of a particular product or basically shadows a particular product and sees how we buy a particular thing right and how the consumption process actually goes through. Now, in the physiological observation method a different approach is taken here, which involves techniques borrowed from medicine, psychology and other sciences. These include cameras for measuring eye movement, galvanic thin response and MRIs. So, in physiological uh, methods what really happen is that consumers actually are made to interact with a particular product in a confined environment of the lab and then several psychological variables for example, pupil response, galvanic skin response. How does the skin? So, if somebody gets excited the skin responds in a certain way by showing temperature changes and so this galvanic skin responses actually tell you when a person is happy or not and I can resort to things of high motion cameras which actually capture. Uh, very, very minute segments of the consumer behavior of how the consumer is interacting with the product in the consumption process or I can use something called MRIs, uh, which are the brain uh, information uh, collecting devices, the magnetic resonance imaging uh, uh, equipments, which can measure that. And so, a very good example that I remember here uh, of the physiological observation method was uh, an experiment which was done by I think Pepsi or Coke, I am not very sure, but one of these software companies to find out uh, can subjects differentiate between tastes of two softwares, uh, two soft drinks, I am sorry. So, they wanted to see whether consumers can differentiate between two soft drinks or in this case two colas and so two different colas were given to people and so uh, instead of asking them to differentiate an MRI was done. So, uh, 
two group of people were taken in and they were asked uh, which uh, which drink do you like which cola do you like whether you like cola a or cola b and so then uh, when they when they said this is cola a and cola b the in actual interest of the researcher here was to find out whether this person is actually telling the truth whether he likes the taste of cola a and cola b or whether there is a differentiation in the taste at all and if there is can the consumer distinguish it so what he did was he arranged several colas several bot, uh, bot, uh, glasses of colas two different colas or three different colas i don't remember exactly here uh, what happened there and so this was given to the two uh, different people who said they like a particular cola and not the other one so both the brands were given to them and when the brands were given to them they were asked to uh, report back which cola they were drinking and what was the taste like and when they were doing this an MRI scan of the brain was done and this why does the MRI scan was done and a galvanic skin response was taken the MRI was actually telling uh, the truth areas of the brain there are certain areas of the brain which actually light up when people say true things and when uh, they for say false things certain areas of the brain light up and what they found out from the MRI uh, in in terms of the blood volume which was or uh, in terms of the brain activity which was happening when these people were actually able to distinguish or not able to distinguish from the res from the results of the experiment they found out that people were not able to tell the differentiation between two colas and so what was happening is most people were actually lying people were not able to distinguish between two different brands of colas and so that was uh, one major uh, experiment uh, which said that people are not very good with taste or people are very people also do something called lying to support particular brands some people are brand loyal but they don't know what the factors which are there and so in this experiment through the mri they found out that the truth areas were not lighted when they were saying that this is my cola or this is the other cola because even the consumers were not satisfied or not convinced that this was what the cola is and the reason was because they were not able to distinguish between the different colas or make a distinction between the taste of the different colas and so this is one example of how a physiological observation method can be used in addition to the observation methods an interview and survey method can also be used for collecting data from cons uh, consumers and doing consumer behavior research. So, what happens here? Surveys are an efficient way to gathering information from a large sample of consumers by asking questions and recording responses. So, suppose if a product comes in, um, uh, a new product comes in or a product makes some kind of a different rebranding of it that they want to know how does consumers perceive this rebranding or if new product comes in they want to see where is the chance of this product, where does it start, where does it stand, if that is what it is they can do uh, uh, a survey method can be employed. Now, what happens in the survey is that a number of questions are taken in and people are asked uh, whether they know about this product or product related questions. Now, there can be several types of uh, surveys that is what I have written they can be conducted by mail, telephone, internet in person and so on and so forth. So, what can happen is some sometimes a uh, particular product comes in a new branding a rebranding of a product is done and so for uh, collecting information about how people feel about this particular product what uh, how would uh, people react to this kind of a change or this kind of a repositioning what happens is the survey is done in surveys several questions are put together in a list and these are either mailed to people so that they can respond at their own time and send it back to uh, you so it goes through the mail or a telephone person so uh, next time when you are calling uh, some telephone company mobile operator they of course says that so, please rate this call, it goes to a rating system and so on and so forth and that is a method of survey to find out how many people like me or like my product and so on and so forth or it could be in internet. So, there will be say whenever you go to the internet there are several sites which ask you to rate it in terms of 5 point scale, 7 point scale, 10 point scales and so on and so forth how satisfied you are and so these are in uh, ways of collecting surveys. So, there, there could be several questions, there could be one question, number of questions and so this survey when it goes to number of people, a number of question goes to number of people generally it is few questions only about the product. So, we gather data about how the public in general feel about it and uh, this is also helpful in doing market segmentation. So, some methods of uh, doing uh, uh, the surveys and interviews uh, is uh, one of the method is called the focus group method. Now, in the focus group method what really happens is uh, consists of 8 to 12 people 
involves in a discussion led by a moderator skilled in persuading consumers to discuss thoroughly on a topic of uh, interest and researchers. So, in generally in focus group what happens is those people who have been with this product, who have interacted with this product or who has been loyal to this product or at least know about this product and those people who have been sharp critics are put into a room. So, 5 or 6 people or 6 to 12, 8 to 12 people are put into a room and there is a moderator and then these people discuss the benefits or the problems that can happen by the repositioning uh, the particular product or if a new product comes in what can happen by the uh, by the coming of this product and so on and so forth. And so, in fo focus group what really happens is all the uh, the uh, uh, facts come out in the open. So, people uh, come to see a number of facts which are into the open, number of facts jump out in the open and that is how you collect data. So, uh, you come to know, so in, in a focus group people since people who have used this product and who have uh, the, who have experience, say they start discussing. So, what the moderator's job here is to basically persuade consumers to discuss things related to the particular topic of interest to the researcher. Uh, for example, if I want to know whether if I am a company uh, which is selling electronic products and I wanted to know uh, whether it is uh, the hardware which is interesting a particular which is inviting a particular person a consumer to buy my product or it is a design feature which is basically ma making a consumer come in and buy my product. Now, what I will do is I can do a focus interview or a focus group a discussion in which what will happen is people who, who have experience with this kind of a product or maybe my product will come in and a moderator will start discussing and he will uh, at all points of time he will try to bring back the question to whether hardware is the reason or why you are buying it or you are not buying it. And so, that kind of a thing can happen and so, people discuss all the good points, the bad points, the benefits of how they brought. So, they can also discuss the process of buying and so many other uh, products. So, these people focus group who have experience they start discussing. Now, understanding the share in the uh, last example that we will discuss in surveys, the survey could go to somebody who has actually not used a product and so in those cases it is an actually a waste. But in a focus group, we are only concerned with people who have used that product, 8 or 12 people who have used that product or has an idea about that product and who has uh, criticisms about it. And so, we'll, the information that get we get from there is more beneficial because the moderator is at all points of time is focusing on to the product or making people focus on to the product or the benefits of the product and so that is how this is done. We can also have something called longitudinal studies. Now, uh, longitudinal studies are what it involves repeated me measure of consumer activities over time to determine changes in their opinion buying and consumption behavior. Let us say brand loyalty. Now, brand loyalty is something where people are loyal to a particular brand. Now, if you want to study brand loyalty, we want to study why people like Apple or Apple users actually like Apple. What is the reason why Apple users like Apple? Suppose we are interested in that question. Now, how we do it? We can do a longitudinal study in the sense that when we will measure people's reaction to various versions of the Apple coming in. So, the iPhone 5 comes in, we will measure their reactions, we will go interview them, we will buy, we will look at their opinion, buying, consumption process, how do they consume, how do they buy, how do they interact with the product and when uh, iPhone 6 comes in, we will again measure the same thing when iPhone 7 comes in and but what we are doing is we are measuring the same kind of people. So, let us say we have a group of people A, B, C, D, E, we measure these people or we target these people and measure their opinion, measure their buying process, the consumption process of buying Apple different versions of the Apple phone and if we know or different Apple products for that matter and if it stays there or if it uh, the the person still stays with that with through uh, various versions or through various changes of it, they still stay with that particular product, then we say that they are brand loyal. And so, in, in longitudinal studies, what we do is over a period of time, over a period of 10 years, 5 years, 10, 15 years, whatever it is, we measure the same people for the same products and we constantly know or evaluate their opinions. 
Now, common method of collecting data is through membership clubs and customer loyalty programs. And the one of the best methods of collecting longitudinal study data is through membership clubs. And so that is why you have the Harley Davidson Club, you have the Apple Club, you have uh, the HP Club, and so on and so forth. What these clubs tend to do you is at point at different points of time they collect a num number of data from you of how things are working, how do you like it, how do you don't like it, and so many other things which are of importance there, which are of important to us and that is what the longitudinal study is all about. We also can do an experimentation to study consumer behavior and what is experimentation? In experimentation uh, as a research methodology attempts to understand cause and effect relationship by carefully manipulating the independent variable. So, for example, the number of ads, packaging, design etc. to determine how this changes the dependent variable for example, purchase intent or behavior. Now, generally speaking the methods that we have dealt up till now were all non-experimental methods. And so, one of the problems with non-experimental method is control. So, there are several factors, there are several exogenous variables, external variables which might affect the data that we are collecting or the authenticity of the data. And to minimize that, we can also design an experiment which is a controlled way of studying something. So, we can design an experiment for studying consumer behavior. And so, uh, the, what is an experiment? As I ex explained, most experimentation methods actually looked at cause and effect relationship between uh, particular independent and dependent variable. So, what is the independent variable here? Again, independent variables are those factors which are manipulated. And so, in this case, as I explained, if I am interested in finding out how if people are influenced by the number of ads that is pr present for a particular product, what I will do is I will look at, I will make two or three groups, I will have a control group, I will have a high ad group, I will have a low ad group. So, three different things. Now, my question is finding out whether the number of ads of a product, particular product has anything to do, I, uh, do uh, with the purchase intent, whether people buy more or less, whether people are happy purchasing with the number of ads. So, what I will do is I will make three groups, one is the high ad group, the one is the low ad group and one is the no ad group, where no ad is there and that is called the control group. So, three ad groups are there, I will give them different kinds of ads, different number of ads which are there, high ad group might get 8, 10 ads of a particular product, low ad group will be get 1 or 2 ads of the product and no ad of course, is a control, so does not get any ads. And so, different different products I will take in and different different number of ads I will manipulate and then give it to those people. Once I do that, I will actually see whether people say or whether people uh, in, in a mock environment and virtual environment tend to buy more or tend to attempt to buy more after looking at more ads and less ads. So, the number of ads which is independent which which I can change is called the independent variable and the effect that it is happening on happening on or the effect that it is creating on buying behavior is called the dependent variable. So, buying behavior is dependent variable. So, if I do more buying after more number of ads as I could successfully say that number of ads uh, actually help you buying or if people decrease they are buying behavior with the number of ads, I can say it is an inverse relationship. And so, this is kind of an experimentation. It is a very basic experiment that I have explained to you. So, this kind of experimentation is done. Why experimentation? The reason being that it is more uh, has more control. Here, external variables uh, may not be affected. For example, external noise influences by your uh, friends. If you, if I do this experiment in, in open, what would happen is your friends would suggest something and so your answers will different, will be different so on and so forth. Now, in a laboratory condition, I can do a number of control. Now, this experiment itself can be of two uh, types. So, one could be a laboratory experiment and as I said, in a laboratory experiment, a number of control variables can be managed. So, all variables can be controlled, a number of variables can be controlled and so, uh, a number of things can be done uh, and so control is very high. So, here it is conducted in a physical environment, commercial academic space that permits maximum control of variable being studied. So, for example, I keep you in a lab, I give you different different uh, colas which are there and I ask you to uh, do a taste of it and then later on uh, I will show you a feedback of whether you are able to distinguish between them or not or distinguish with the taste between cola A and B. This is called lab experimentation where I make you sit into a lab. Now, here the control is very high because you have no response from outside, nobody is there in the out, outside world which is going to help you neither. Uh, the, so, there will be variable, uh, there will be constant no, uh, noise if, if there is any. So, there will be no noise condition, the temperatures would not vary, uh, pressures would not vary, you will be in a comfortable situation doing this and so all these things will be controlled. Whereas, if I do something called a field experiment, it 
is basically experimenting into the natural setting and so in the, for example in a in a um, home or store and so in field experimentation a good example is trying out things so you might have often seen in a supermarket when you go uh, what happens is somebody says okay you want to taste this particular product and see how how it uh, looks like so don't buy it just taste it and tell me what it is that's a field experiment so what they want to f see is that whether different brands of coffee or whether your different brands of coffee is liked by consumer or not because if it is liked the consumer might think of buying it if it is not they might not think of buying it and so you can vary the strength of uh, the coffees or uh, if, you, if you are selling coffee or, or if maybe you are selling pizza so you can offer them free measure the strengths various strengths of it give it to people and see whether they like it or not but generally when these experiments are done into a closed atmosphere into a home or a store what really happens is that the controls are very less because there will be so many extraneous variables which might actually hamper the results so this is the field experiment and lastly we have something called consumption research now it focuses on how people use products rather than how they buy them and can involve any of the research methodologies so consumption research is another kind of consumer behavior research that we tend to do and here what we are interested in is not how people actually buy products but how actually they use it and so what uh, of in, uh, what is of interest to people is so so how do you actually buy a product and get rid of it that's what they are interested in and so from that they uh, tend to uh, the data they collect from that they tend to improve product designs or improve product features find out how to dispose of product and so many other things such as that and so for doing consumption research any of the methodologies that we have discussed before can be used it could be observation it could be a survey or it could be an experimentation now this approach requires uh, researchers to get inside people's home places and to understand how lifestyle values societal trends affect consumption and so what happens here is here we want to study how people consume products how people actually after buying it how do you deal with it and so there are several variables and if you are interested in any one of these variables of how societal pressures or normative beliefs or any other factors actually go ahead and help in consumption or or influence consumption of influence using a particular product we will be uh, doing something called consumption research okay so this marks the end of the first two sections of consumer behavior and so quickly recapping what we did so in in the first uh, section of this particular two lecture series what we did was we looked at what is consumer behavior what kind of consumers are available and uh, things like what is a shopper buyer and what is individual benefits and how do people look at benefits or bundle benefits and those kind of things is what we were really interested in and then we also looked at the second part is market segmentation of looking at how marketers actually segment uh, the market or divide the market so that they can uh, uh, give the maximum benefit to maximum people because uh, one one to one marketing is not possible as uh, psychology would say so if you if you are if you want to know uh, why people do what they do in a market or why people buy and consume and how do they consume all those questions then you need to understand this market segmentation because everybody is different so what we do is in market segmentation we classify people who are together who are looking for similar benefits and then we study them right so that was what we did in the first two lectures in this lecture what we did was we looked at how does the consumer so once the market segmentation is done and we divide the market according to people the people actually go into the field and they start buying so in this particular lecture we saw uh, in this particular lecture we saw how people actually when they go into the market how do they decide those several steps to there and that starts with understanding that the product is there understanding product information making those decision processes decision decision variables and uh, actually then uh, going on and deciding how to buy it and there are several factors that we saw psychological variables that we saw which may come in uh, picture and make you the final decision and in the last section we saw how the research is done in consumer behavior we, so we started with something called observation research in which the uh, the uh, researcher actually observes your behavior and knows several things into it or you can do something called a survey and an interview in a survey and an interview you survey people you do interview personal interviews with people with a focus group with a longitudinal study with a cross sectional study and so on and so forth and study why people do what they do in a market and study consumer uh, behavior and the last part of it is the experimentation so we can also do an experimentation and study why consumer do what they do or how do the consumers behave in a market and why is it necessary is it necessary to see whether the product you have is an actual match to the uh, uh, to the consumer and all of this is the benefit 
the benefit part of it of a product is the underlying uh, thing. So why do consumers buy? Consumers buy because they are looking for benefits and not for products and so that is the end line which is there. So in the next section when we meet, we will be looking at the consumer decision process in detail and for now I will sign off. Thank you.